Welcome back to another episode of Is Fitz Happy. I'm Luke. And I'm Emma. And this week we're discussing chapter 28 of Mad Ship, Departure of the Paragon. Exciting. I know. It's finally come. We've had a lot of uh, time skips here. Maybe not a lot, but some of them at least. And the last we saw Paragon and the crew there, they were getting ready to... um, kind of clean everything up, load all of their new stock, their uh, their new food goods and everything like that, and just doing the final touches on the inside. And we are joining them this time when they are just about to depart, the day of, actually. Yeah, and not as high-spirited as you high spirited as you would think it would be yeah because they've kind of maintained that uh doom and gloom attitude the whole time right they are ready to go and they're we join in with discussions uh, amongst brash and amber and althea and they're just kind of rehashing the same conversations over and over that's the theme for the first couple pages here yes and most of it is i wish we you know had more time and could do more trials Mm mm-hmm um, but they don't have time or money. <laughs> yes, exactly. Amber says, a few more sea trials, Althea, and we'll have no crew left at all because they kind of just leave in droves right. after they're going through stuff. And uh, Brashen says, yep, yeah, we've gone over this lots of times. Um, you'll have to get used to that, Amber, <laughs> as we're on sea. <laughs> that's just what sailors do. We just repeat the same small conversations and complain about the same stuff. Chief topics, the bad food, the stupid captain, and the unfair mate. You forgot the rotten weather and unruly ship, Althea added. Amber shrugs and says, I have a lot to become accustomed to. It has been years since I took an extended sea voyage. As a youth, I was a bad sailor. I hope my living aboard here in the harbor will have schooled my stomach to a moving deck. Althea and Brash and both grin because they know that's not the case and mm-hmm. she'll probably be seasick, but... At least for a little bit. Right. But Brashen warns her that he won't expect much out of her for the first few days. But after a while, if he needs her, he needs her. And she needs to figure out how to do that. Mm-hmm. But I thought it was interesting to highlight. Uh, I haven't taken an extended sea voyage in a while. Um, because we know the fool came from down south from Claris. Mm-hmm. And then was in uh, Jamalia. And then sailed up to Buckheap. Right. And presumably sailed from Buckkeep to Bingtown in some capacity. I think the fool got dropped off somewhere. Oh, by the dragon. Yeah. That's my interpretation, at least. Okay. But it would have been a shorter trip from Buckkeep to Bingtown than Jamalia to Buckkeep. So, because it takes, you know... What, like a month or two to sail from Bingtown to Jamalia? So I thought Jamalia was on the way to Buckkeep. No. Do I have the map mixed up? I'm so bad at yeah, reading Yeah, we maps. talked about this. Remember, um, Buckkeep and the Six Suchies is in the north. And then north, yes, yeah. east of them are the Out Islands. Right, right, right. Directly south of the Six Suchies is Chelsid. And then directly south of them is Bingtown and the mm-hmm. Rainwild River. And then further south is the Marrow Peninsula, where Wintrow got sent for um, priests, priesthood. Mm -hmm. And along that coast is all the Pirate Isles. And then south of that is Jamalia. Interesting. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And then even further south, which is not mapped, I believe, is the other things, like um, Claris and the place that the fool grew up, etc. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, yeah the, you're right. It probably would, even if Amber got dropped off, like, in the middle, still not a very far journey. Yeah, compared to this, especially if they're going to, they don't know where Vivacia <laughs> is. Right. It's going to be, you know, probably at least a month or two in their yeah. estimations. Good point, good point. So, they are still kind of preparing and... You know, ragging on each other a little bit. Oh, you're you're so cheery. Thanks mm-hmm. for anticipating that things might go wrong and you're going to need me even as I'm <laughs> seasick. <laughs> right. Thanks, Brashen. And a silence falls over them 
and despite their easy words, they had all had reservations about what they faced today. The ship was loaded, most of the crew aboard. Secreted, secreted below decks, unbeknownst to their hired crew, were seven slaves who had resolved to take this opportunity to escape to a new life. Althea tried not to think of them. So, as mentioned before in the previous chapters, some of the workers that were helping you know, to fix up Paragon that Elth or excuse me, that Amber had found are staying below decks to escape their life from Bingtown. But it is scary because who knows what would happen if anybody finds out. Right. And not just to the slaves, but to Althea and Brashen and Amber as well. Yep. So there's a lot of uncertainty going on and it's just adding to the nerves that are already there. There's just so much that can go wrong. Mm-hmm. She mentions that at first light they would sail, and Althea almost wished they could slip away now. But to sail off silently into the dimness would be an ill leave-taking. Better to wait and endure the farewells and good wishes of those who came to see them off. Better also to have clear light and the morning breezes to speed them. How is he? Brashen asked quietly, stared off into the distance. He's anxious and excited, eager and scared to death. His blindness, I know, Brashen was brusque, but he's endured it for years. He got himself back to Bingtown blind and capsized. There is no time for a risky experiment in carving wizard wood. He'll have to trust us, Amber. He has done so much to turn himself around that I don't want to risk changing any of his conditions. If you tried and failed, well, Brashen shook her. I have Brashen shook her head in my book. I also have that. Okay. Brashen shook his head. I think it's better for us to sail as he is. He's familiar with this hindrance. I think he can cope better with blindness he's accepted than with a great disappointment. But he has never accepted it, Amber began earnestly. 42, Althea cut in. She gave a sigh but managed to smile. We've had this conversation at least 42 times. So this is a... Uh, Something that was just broached with Amber at the end of the last chapter that we saw her in right. is Paragon wishing for Amber to try to cure his blindness by recarving him. And Amber went away from that conversation saying, I'll think about it. I don't want to risk it. But here we kind of jump in and apparently enough time has passed where Amber's like, yes, I want to help Paragon. Mm -hmm. And enough time has passed where they've had this argument and conversation multiple times amongst themselves, whether they could risk it or not. The consensus is no. Right. Right. Because like Brashen said, there is a lot of risk. This isn't something that's ever been done before. Right. And who knows what would happen to him if they're on sea and Amber fails. So definitely fair on Brashen's part, although it does feel unfair as a fan of Paragon to be like, no, don't let him have his way. Right. But I don't know. I think I, I get it. I get why Brashen says no. And finally, the topic turns to Lavoy, another topic that Amber brings up. Mm -hmm. And... Brashen groans, then laughs. Apparently he's offshore the night before they sail. And then when he comes back on, he'll have a hangover and be, you know, uh, a tyrant and mean to the crew. But that's kind of traditional and expected. And he says that I expect he'll drive them hard and they'll resent him. That's traditional, too. He's the best we could have hired for the job. Althea bit her tongue firmly. She had lost count of how many times she and Brashen had wrangled about that. Besides, if they got into it again, he would probably make her admit that Lavoie was not as bad as she expected him to be. The man had a streak of fairness in him. It was unreliable, but when it did surface, he held himself to it. He would be a tyrant, she knew that. So did Brashen. As long as he did not go too far with it, a tyrant was exactly what this crew needed. So, slight... Shift in perspective from Althea, mm -hmm. not a change of heart necessarily, but a shift of perspective and, you know, giving Lavoy a chance and seeing that like, yeah, he, he can be decent. Right. But interestingly, it's brought up, which implies that there has been a lot of trouble with Lavoy during this trial period time. I noticed that as well. And I 
don't know if that's Robin Hobb's intention or if it's just since so much time has passed, we need to touch on all the topics that we left in the last chapter, you mm-hmm. know? More as a literary device. Yeah, than- because yeah. it doesn't make sense in the explanation that we get. Right. All we get is that uh, Brash and Grown, so maybe there has been some trouble with him being too right. tough or anything. But then he laughs and he's like, oh, it's fine. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It is. I feel like my biggest gripe with this book is how often, specifically this book, how often each chapter everything is retouched on as though it's been books in between the last time we touched these characters. There's a ton of time skips. And I think the past maybe six or eight chapters every single chapter has had like at least a week time skip between right but also if you're reading this book you're probably reading it in a specific setting or like in one go maybe not in one go that's not fair but right you know you're not doing so, uh, reading in between enough to forget this detail maybe you are maybe it's just because we're so in depth that it feels too redundant but i don't know I I feel like at least with this chapter in mind, um, it's retouching on the points, but not the specific details. Because since time has passed, different attitudes or thoughts towards these topics have changed, which is why I don't mind it as much. Okay. Because like yeah, they touched on the carving of Paragon and Lavoy and whatever, but they're the different attitudes. Right. There's different circumstances around them. People think about those topics differently. Right. But I would say that the carving of Paragon makes sense to touch on. Lavoy does not. So that's what I mean. That's why I'm saying I think it's a literary device for this because we left off with a huge question mark of like Althea hates Lavoy. He's going to be an issue. And I don't know. I Well, see, but I disagree because then she had to deal with him and she begrudgingly recognizes that he was okay after he gave her a few tests I mean. and so yeah there's <laughs> i don't know it just feels like this has already been answered mm, and then okay. this is the exact same thing over again and that happens a lot not just in this yeah and so i think this is just the most recent thing for me to be able to point out and be like it's you know bugging what? you a bit in the book yeah exactly like actually this does bother me because she doesn't do it with fits and i'll have to watch out for the next book to see if it happens too but like i don't remember it being this bad last book it doesn't it it does happen with fits i will say but it doesn't feel like it happens because it's one perspective always Mm -hmm. and we're used to fitz's he dwells on things right and he runs them over in his head over and over again and sure maybe they're you know different sides of the same coin but it's like always approaching the same like oh, I just want my own life and mm-hmm. leave me alone. And my I'll touch my pin to remind me of shrewd, <laughs> my promise to shrewd. And, you know, right. it's, it is touching on those like same topics in general. Like, I'm not talking specifics, but it just doesn't, to me, it doesn't feel the same as this maybe because this one is shifting perspectives and every single perspective shift touches on a topic right. that they touched on the last chapter that we saw them in. Yeah. So it's way more repetitive for this. Yeah. And I guess it happens in like every book ever, whenever you have a series and right. you're into the next book, they have to assume that there's been a lot of time between. So yeah, they need to catch you up. The beginning of any, every book in this series does yeah. that. Yeah. And I also find that tedious, yeah, but I understand same. the point of that. Mm-hmm. Even if I don't read that way, I, whatever mm-hmm. I get it, but this is just, the chapter to chapter chapter in the to chapter of it. yes yeah. it's like okay <laughs> i just read it i know what they said i don't know whatever too much of a tangent but i just <laughs> wanted to make sure that 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 was put out especially with this random lavoy bit mm-hmm. yeah interesting yes. well althea does admit here that maybe a tyrant is what they need for their crew because the sea trials that we mentioned before when they were taking paragon out and running it through its paces have revealed all the weaknesses in the crew. And now they know what crew members are going to be lazy, which ones are going to try to 
do as much as possible, which ones can't do what is expected of them, like mm-hmm. all of the weaknesses and strengths of each of the crew members. Right. And this crew leaves a lot um, to be wanted. <laughs> yes. They have a lot lacking in their skill set here. And she approached Brashen about them being like, hey, we need more. And what shut her up about it is Brashen being like, okay, I will replace every man on this crew if you can find me sailors who are better for the same pay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically. That's like the issue. Yeah, he basically gave her full reign to replace anybody she wanted under the caveat that they had to take the pay he had for them. Yeah. Althea also uh, says that the sea trials had exposed more than the weaknesses of the crew. She knew now that Paragon was far more fragile than she had ever expected. He, true, he was a stoutly built ship and everything kind of was tip-top shape physically, but he did not sail like a live ship. And Althea was ready to accept that as long as he did not actively oppose the men working his decks. Right. What was most difficult for her was his obvious torment. Every time Brashen called for a change, a course change, the figure had flinched. His hands would break free briefly from his crossed arms to tremble before him. Almost instantly, he would recross his arms and hold them firm against his chest. His jaws were clenched tightly shut, but his fear simmered throughout the ship. All around her, Althea could see the crew reacting to it. They glanced at one another, up at the rigging, out over the water, all seeking the source of their uneasiness. They were too new to the ship to realize they were infected with his fear. That made them more prone to panic, not less. To tell them the cause would only have made it worse. They would learn, she had promised herself, in time they would learn. So, basically she's saying, yeah, Paragon is affecting the mood of the sailors because he is terrified of being led into something dangerous and not being able to see where he's going. Mm -hmm. And the crew not knowing the source of their fear makes it worse. But if they were directly told that Paragon is making you feel this, they would be even more scared. But she's hoping if they find out gradually over time or understand it, it'll be like, okay, it's not my fear. I can learn to deal with it. So it's it seems to me just kind of like, putting it off a bit (laughs) yeah definitely an ethical gray area if not horrible (laughs) i get it i guess they don't they can't really afford to have more people leave the ship but also feels like something they should just say up front i don't know yeah poor paragon though he is uh he's not feeling great about it he's putting on a brave face but Yeah, I do feel bad for Paragon. Mm -hmm. We jump over to Malta's point of view now. It is the next morning because this was the night before that they were going to Paragon was going to sail. And now they are getting ready. The Vestrit family is getting ready to go down to the docks to watch Paragon sail away and bid farewell. Right. And they are going with Devad. Mm-hmm. And Malta makes note that his car- uh, carriage is freshly refurbished and yes. its hinges no longer squeak. The door firmly shuts closed. The upholstery has been thoroughly cleaned, although she feels like she can still smell dead pig. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it's definitely all dressed up in a way that it wasn't before. She mentions that she didn't sleep well last night to her mother, Kefria. And I highlighted that because there is a struggle with dragons later in this uh, section. And I am anticipating that Tintaglia has been visiting her dreams. Right. Because Rain has uh, forsworn going down there now. And mm-hmm. it's been, you know, probably another month or so or a couple weeks since he made that deal with Janie. So Tintaglia is probably a little bit anxious. Right. So... uh of course, when she says I didn't sleep well last night, Kefri is like, well, it's natural for you to be excited. You know, the, the ball's only eight days away. We're getting close. Right. <laughs> Devadra start, of course, butts into the conversation saying, yeah, quite natural. You shall see, my dear. This, this shall mark the turn of all our fortunes. So Devad is very excited about this venture. Yes. I think because Devad thinks... That Malta's definitely getting married to Rain, which means he now has a connection in the Rain Wild. Right. 
even though he hates the rain wilds people yes. because uh remember if you guys haven't if you've been listening with us week to week it's been a while since we talked about it but he blames the rain wild for the death of his family right he thinks that they're the reason the blood plague happened yes exactly he thinks the blood plague came from messing with that you know magic up the river so uh, Ronica <laughs> agrees with Devad saying, I'm, I think this will turn all of our fortunes, but to Malta, it seems more like a prayer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they arrive at the docks, they dismount, and uh, Devad's like, no, don't get the door yet. My, like, my servant will get it for you, but it's obvious, a, obviously a slave. So the, the slave opens up the door, and as they disembark, they all thank the slave, who is very uncomfortable, and looks at Devad, who's not paying attention, thankfully. Right. Because the slave is like, I don't think people should be talking to me. Right. Also, notably, not the they all, just Kefria and Ronica. Yes. True. So Malta and Devad do not. And Malta frowns briefly to herself as she notices that, because Devad is kind of as I said, not paying attention, because he is busy straightening his new jacket. And she thinks either Devad had become more prosperous lately, or he had simply decided to be freer with his money. The repaired carriage, the trained driver, Devad's new clothes. He was preparing for something. She made a mental note to be more watchful of the old trader. Foolish as Devad was socially, he had a shrewd streak for sensing profit. Perhaps there was a way to turn whatever he was doing to her family's advantage as well. Uh, I, I highlight a lot of things in this with different colors because I want to talk about different aspects of this short couple sentences. Sure. And first, I want to talk about Devad. Um, he, we know he has connections to Chalced. He's been working with like the new traders that are coming in from Jamalia and also Chalcedian traders mm-hmm. trying to act as go-betweens to sell with the old traders' land. All of that sort of stuff. So it is my belief, and I don't remember if it's confirmed. I almost have (laughs) like 60% sure it's maybe confirmed later, or maybe it already has been, that he knows the satrap is coming. Did he mention that at one of the council meetings? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. But I think he knows that the satrap is coming. And that's why he's being more free with his money, straightening up his household and being like, I need to make a good impression because this is where the profit is going to be in. There. However, that brings a very interesting question to my mind, which is if he knew everything was in such disrepair, why wouldn't he have fixed it at least a little bit before now? I mean, I understand that he is frugal, And he's not trying to be excessive Mm -hmm. in his spending, but there are ways to be frugal and not look run down. You know what I mean? Sure. But you have to remember because he is tact like tactless socially, Mm -hmm. he literally doesn't care about his household because no one goes there. He doesn't throw any parties anymore, whatever. Mm -hmm. Two old traders were already shunning him. So he didn't really have a reason to dress up. And like the new traders kind of needed him to act as a go between because he is an old trader. Right. So he was needed by the people he was making money from anyways. So he didn't need to look perfect. You know, he was just valuable for who he was. Okay. And we know when the satrap comes, he offers the satrap his house. Right. So now I think he's like, I have plans for the future. I need to look good. My house needs to look good and it needs to be proper. So the satrap accepts my house to stay in because then I'll have more power and influence and I can get more money out of that. Okay. So I think now he sees it as a benefit to him rather than it wasn't detracting before it did in everybody else's eyes, but in his eyes, it didn't detract being slovenly and not having new clothes. Mm -hmm. But I think now he sees a benefit of spending the money and looking better and cleaning everything up. Okay. Besides, he also, what, probably made a little bit of money as a go-between between the Paragon sale. True, yeah. Um. So maybe he was feeling a little flush with cash. 
I doubt it, knowing Devon. <laughs> but the second thing I highlighted in here was uh, Malta's insistence that, one, he has a shrewd sense for profit, mm-hmm. and two, that she was going to try to turn something to her family's advantage out of this situation. Right. These seemed a little out of character for me. Okay. Not a lot. I can justify it in my mind. Mm-hmm. It just seemed like one of those small little leaps again that we didn't see the development for. Okay. In like the intervening months that we skipped or something. Right. It's just such a an actual good judge of character that before Malta's view of Devad is oh he's just a toad and she mentions that later on here too like he's a disgusting man but literally that's where it stopped and started now it's a decent judge of what he is capable of and how she can turn that to her advantage and that he's disgusting I I would say I think it's excusable because Devad was the one acting as the go-between between the par- for the Paragon sale. Maybe. And so Malta would have been part of that and would have seen how he managed that sale and got them the ship that they needed. Uh, yeah, like, so- I guess. It just doesn't fit in with my view of her character because the last we saw her, she had her whole disillusionment in men and the power right. that men hold. And now she's holding Devad in slightly higher esteem for his capabilities. But I don't think it's because he's a man. I don't think it's like, oh, all men okay. are powerful. He's a man that's powerful. I think it's Devad has shown. I know because that's the opposite right. of what her development has gone to. Right. Yeah. I, I think it's more Devad has shown his usefulness. I think Malta is very capable when it comes to picking apart people's traits and assessing what they are good for, even if it's through a lens of, a child who doesn't know a ton about the world, she still is pretty accurate about knowing how to use other people and what their role can be. That I'll agree with. So, I don't agree with judging people's traits. I I do. I mean, even if she does it, I don't know how to explain this because I was just about to say, even if she does it wrong, <laughs> she she like has a way of judging a person accurately and i feel like sometimes that is through a lens that is disagreeable to us as a reader however at the heart of what she is saying it is a very valid statement about people like she has noticed the relationship between brashen and althea which maybe isn't that difficult to spot but she's also noticed things that like althea is not really capable of being proper and while the way she's looking at proper is outdated to us she's not wrong i guess is a good way to phrase that and her grandma she knows her mother is no one she needs to contest with she doesn't ever fight for power with her mom she only goes after ronica and she can see to the quick of what gets under ronica's skin really easily the fact that she looks old (laughs) the fact that she wants to have a good reputation. Like, I don't know. I think Malta is really good at. Seeing, she she seeing is discerning people. in some ways, but I feel like she still has completely wrong reads on some people and is like based entire her like feelings towards those people on those reads. So. I don't know. To me, to me, this is just a little jump too far that we didn't see the development for right. to just be like. Oh, Devad is shrewd and he does, he is good at seeking profit because the only deal she's really seen out of him is the Paragon one. She doesn't really know him. She's tried to distance herself from him. Well, so I, I don't know. Well, yeah, but he has been a family friend her whole life and she's been to multiple trader council meetings, right? And seen how he. How no one likes him. Well, but how he commands the room still. If nobody likes him, why is he able to have say in anything? You know what I because mean? Because he's an old trader and that's how they do everything. If right. you stand up, but, you can talk. <laughs> sure. But I'm saying if he's so so incompetent, why do people still do business with him? 
I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Just I'm um, like you had before with your read of this. To me, my read of this is just doesn't quite make sense. Right. The development too far that we did not see. And like I said, it's a small jump. I can justify it in my mind. Mm-hmm. Just it doesn't keep pace with where I thought her development was. Okay. So Devad offers his arm to Ronica. Ronica allows it. And then they walk down the uh, the docks. They're making note of... Well, Malta is making note that they look fairly fashionable right now. Ronica insisted that they needed to look their best and not look poor at this point. And, she, and Malta admits to herself that Rach was developing into quite a seamstress and that Rach had an eye for copying the newer styles on the streets of Bingtown. Today, they were almost fashionable, save for last year's parasols. Even Selden was properly dressed. So Selden is along, and he has actual lines of dialogue this time Mm -hmm. in this chapter. Yeah. Very surprising. I think he doubles his lines for the whole book in this (laughs) chapter, maybe. Yeah. He says, being a proper little traitor is choking me, he returns. (laughs) Yes, because she tells him that... Being a pro- or a proper little trader boy does not fuss with his collar. <laughs> <laughs> so they are walking along. Her mother is following her grandmother and Devad and Malta's following them. Right. It was kind of like in a long little train here. She makes note that all the boys are wolf whistling at her and she's not allowed to acknowledge it. But it does give her pride to know that all the men are stopping to look. She could not deign to notice them, but it was still gratifying to see the sailors' heads turn as she passed. A few made admiring, if unseemly, comments to their fellows. She kept her head up and did not change her pace. Sharp and sudden, she wished she were a three-ships girl. She could have winked and flirted back, and no one would think she had made a bad match if she attracted a hearty young sailor. She was having to live as cheaply as a fisher girl. Why could she not have the carefree ways of one? There's a very mature thought on her place in life. Um, Sad, but it's a mature Mm -hmm. thought about it. Because before she's just like, I I don't know. It's just the feeling that I get. You made a face when I mentioned (laughs) that. But it's, it's still, you know, a little bit of like a whiny thing, right? Mm -hmm. But it's different than like, we're so poor. Why do we have to save all this money? Dad will fix everything. And it's my place in life is my place in life. Sometimes I wish we're someplace else, but I'll keep my head up and do what is allotted to me for now. Right. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. It's just funny to hear you say that it's mature when it's about complaining that she can't more openly flirt with boys, I guess, which is like. Not necessarily, not that it's not mature to flirt, but like I, it feels like a very teenage girl thought. So it's funny it, the it juxtaposition kind of, of yeah. it. Like I get that it is a mature mm-hmm. line of thinking. It just that's why I gave you. Yeah, a look. it's it's a very immature topic to talk yes. about <laughs> mature leanings, but it's it's a it's a more grown up way of thinking about a situation than her previous definitely uh, way of thinking. Yeah, and I think. I think it's a good show of growth on her part, but I think it also highlights that this society is very stifling, especially to the women in it. Yeah. And I think before she just couldn't have seen that criticism because she's a good little trader girl and that's what they're supposed to do. And now she realizes like, oh, I am afforded way less freedoms just because of my station and it's not fair. Although... Not quite mature it comes enough with to, privileges as well. Right. Not quite mature enough to see that side of the yeah. coin, I think. But she's getting there, and I think that's appreciated. Yeah, because she equates the, the privileges she gets as a Bingtown trader as only the money. So that's why she equates, like, I'm living as cheaply as a three ships girl. Why can't I act like one? Right. So as they reach the West Wall, where all of the uh, live ships are docked, her grandmother slows and greets each one, and they wish her well. As they go on, but Ronica does take the time to talk to each of them. Right. And Malta notes that all of them speak very politely, but some of them even speak warmly to Ronica, greet her by her name, etc., and wish her well on the journey. 
When they finally reached the Paragon, the rush of emotion she felt surprised Malta. There he was, the blind ship, the mad ship that her family had scraped and strained to refloat. He rode easily beside the dock. His brass gleamed, his wood shone. He looked like a new ship. He held his head high, his arms crossed on his muscled chest. Below his splintered eyes, his jaw was set firmly and his chin jutted. He looked nothing like the rotted old wreck that she had seen on the beach below the cliffs. Selden's small hand tightened on hers. Veronica greets Paragon. Apparently very loudly. Yes. She raised her voice and says it. And Paragon uh, smiles back and says, good day to you. I'm blind, not deaf. You needn't shout. (laughs) Which is very funny. And Veronica does not take offense. Yeah. She... Rashin's like, Paragon, come on. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, Veronica is very determined not to take offense. She just repeats again, what a nice day to sail. And there was an exchange of pleasantries that Malta didn't pay attention to. (laughs) Right. Honestly, I get it. Same. (laughs) Yeah. I feel like part of me is kind of upset that we have to read this moment through Malta's point of view because she doesn't care about the intricacies. And as somebody who loves the little details, I want to know. However, I understand why Hob would do that and why you might want to just skip past the boring monotony. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It happened. We all know. So I don't know. I get it. But a little bit, a little part of me is like, oh, I wish I got to know more details. (laughs) Malta is thinking in her head that she had seen Paragon once when he was like ranting and raving and he doesn't seem like that right now. She had went down to the beach when they were refurbishing him before he floated and she turned around before she got too close because she's, uh, he scared her. So I, I wanted to make note of that because of an event that happens later between them. Mm-hmm. So it seems like they haven't really had much close contact at all. Right. This is as up close and personal as Malta has gotten with Paragon so far. Most of her attention, besides not paying attention to the uh, the pleasantries, was focused between her Aunt Althea and Brashen. She still suspected there was something between them, but today she could detect no sign of it. Brashen was very much Captain Trell today. We get a little description that he is wearing Efren's old captain's clothes but refitted for him Mm -hmm. and malta wonders if he knows that he probably does since he was first mate (laughs) for a while that's fair yeah i do wonder how that came about like did ronica present him with the newly made clothing in his size or did he have to ask you know what i mean like what's the situation here i'm sure he wouldn't have asked i'm assuming it was presented Mm. Because Ronica's all about the appearance. True. You know? But was it presented by Ron- by Ronica or Althea? I would assume Ronica because she would have the clothes yeah. from her late husband. How did they get it fitted to him, though? Like, did Rach come down to the ship? Probably like- Rach, yeah. They probably said, hey, we're going to use these clothes to tailor you and then made him for him. Hmm. That'd be my assumption. Yeah, fair enough. Malta makes note that Althea was dressed surprisingly sedately unusually sedately describes her clothes a bit and says that she even had on shoes yeah she even had on shoes and suspects that it's mostly for show that as soon as they cast off that she'll be back in boys trousers and that Antalthea is decidedly odd (laughs) which is extra funny after she just said i wish i didn't have the burden of having to be a proper old trader right. woman i know and i'm like oh what a weirdo althea can't even <laughs> act normal okay <laughs> she then looks to amber who is even more differently dressed and really enhancing how odd she looks because all of her uh wooden toggles are differently carved shapes and really highlighting the different color of her skin and hair and eyes and not dressed very flatteringly. Uh, it showed that she had a very spare figure, flat-chested and narrow-hipped. She wore a snugly laced vest with fanciful butterflies embroidered on it. The only part of her that seemed at all attractive to Malta was her coloring. She had pulled her long hair back, braided it, and then pinned it to her head. Foreign was the only word that fit her. 
even her earrings did not match. So Malta is kind of busy looking at the clothes and studying the attitudes between the people on deck rather than paying attention to the words being said. Right. I do want to bring up, it's not important, but I thought it was really interesting that Amber is wearing a butterfly vest Mm -hmm. because I feel like anytime I see anything to do with beloved and butterflies, it makes me think of B. So I don't know. Yeah, because B had the prophecy for the man in the butterfly cloak. Yes, yeah. And I mean, obviously, this has nothing to do with that. It doesn't matter, but it's just a fun, a funny little detail to notice. I also was wondering if the braided hairstyle comes from the Mountain Kingdom. And it's something it may be. that Amber is emulating from that, from maybe our beloved Ketrigan. But I don't know. I just, just because I guess I hear braid and I'm like, Ketrigan. <laughs> we jump back in as Brashen is saying, welcome aboard. The others had started up and Brashen comes down and offers his arm to Malta. Not so long ago, she would have felt giddy and flattered. He was handsome enough and challenging in a rakish way. But her fears and her dreams seem to have scorched that part of her to death. And I highlighted this because it's, again hypocritical of her because she was just hoping that she could flirt with other guys and right. very flattered that they were doing that yes so it's just funny though so they get on ship and once on board althea starts you know showing them all what has been done and malta again seems to find it very boring she keeps a politely interested look on her face mm-hmm. she's looking around sees the crew that they were staring a little bit too boldly and their manners too crude for malta to find flattering She wondered how Aunt Althea would fare amongst them in the long weeks to come. Perhaps she enjoyed it, she thought in dismay. She felt distant from all of it as she followed her mother and grandmother on a slow tour of the upper deck. So another outside perspective that the crew is rough and tumble. They are not going to be well behaved. It's been foreshadowed multiple, multiple times on this already. (laughs) So that is what we have to look forward to. (laughs) But uh, Brashen is on top of the gangplank where the other well-wishers have begun to gather, and Malta makes note that at least people are kind of coming out to wish them well on this journey. They're finally showing a little bit of support at least this much, and it seems to be a substantial turnout. People well-dressed from old trader families and captains and sailors who are working on the docks as well. She also mentions that... Some of these traders are speaking to Devod. Yep. The a trade- few even paused. Uh-huh. <laughs> She's very surprised. Yes. The trader had sagaciously stationed himself by Brashen, where anyone coming aboard must greet him as well. Malta gathered that he had been able to restore slightly his reputation with the other traders by acting as a go-between in this arrangement. Even so, the greetings they gave him were formal and brief. Devod beamed as if he didn't know any better. At the slightest excuse, he began to he began a well-rehearsed and long-winded account of all he had done to make today possible. Malta was careful to stay out of earshot and not make any eye contact with him. The man was a toad. <laughs> oh yeah, Devod. Taking advantage of a situation. So Kefria Uh, gets her attention and says, are you coming? Because it looks like they're about to tour the rest of the ship, not just the deck where they're at. And Malta's like, I don't really want to go inside. So (laughs) I'm going to stay out here. (laughs) The weather's so nice. I'm I'm going to stay here. I do want to say, I thought to get to a ship's hold in old timey boats like this, it was like a ladder, not stairs. It's called... I believe it's called a ship's ladder, but they're the very, very steep stairs. It's like, um, I don't know. I've climbed a few in my time, like at work in mechanical spaces. Mm -hmm. They're just like very steep and there's kind of, it's like more of a, uh, like an A-frame ladder where it's at an angle and you can like walk up and down it with like a railing, Mm -hmm. but it's very steep. So it's technically stairs but it's steep enough to probably require three points of contact (laughs) okay well i was just i was thinking about it because how are 
all these fine ladies getting up and down it in the big dresses. I just feel like that would be a tripping hazard. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe in uh, live ships, they are made differently. Yeah, fair enough. Maybe it's a little bit more easily accessible. But yeah, I I don't think... um, I don't think it's like a straight up and down vertical ladder that you climb up and down. It's usually kind of stair-ish. Okay, sure. But either way, Malta does not want to be there. So she makes an excuse that she'd rather stay and enjoy the good weather, which does make Althea hesitate because much to Malta's surprise, she does seem to realize the kind of men that are aboard the ship and seems hesitant to leave her niece with them. However, she then agrees to let her stay and Malta realizes it's because Amber and Althea have had some sort of silent communication that has made Althea feel as though Malta will be safe up on deck. Yeah, with Amber. Malta makes a note of that. That's interesting that apparently Amber is enough to keep her safe. Right. And interesting, too, to be left in the company of such a mysterious and scandalous figure as the foreign bead maker. Kefria says, behave yourself, and they head off on their way, and Malta tries to make conversation with Amber. Right. So they're very politely, uh, very polite to begin with, I guess, I will say. Just like, you know, good luck on your journey, (laughs) Mistress Amber. It's really odd because Malta is coming at this sort of as though she's excited to get to talk to somebody she probably shouldn't which is Amber, because it would look weird in any other situation. But also she's coming at it as this is a some sort of thing where she has to gain the upper hand for whatever reason. Every conversation. Because she views conversing with people, I guess, as battles that need Mm -hmm. to be won instead of, you know, talking to people. And it's funny because we know that this is beloved (laughs) and beloved hates when people are fake and underhanded, I think. I think that's pretty well established. So it's really funny that Malta cannot get a read and is just mad because Amber is so adept at kind of just courteously replying without making it more of a conversation. She's able to sort of indicate, I don't want to talk to you in a very polite way. And Malta tires of the game and bluntly asks, do you think there is any chance you'll succeed? So finally, you know, a show of caring for her family here. Um, She's wondering if this was all a fanciful exercise, a show of caring by her family, or was there truly a chance they might rescue her father? So she's asking an outside person now, what do you think? And finally showing herself truly to Amber a bit. So Amber opens back up to her. Right. Basically saying that there is a chance of anything happening, and the more people try to make something happen, the more likely that is and a lot of people have tried to create the situation where your father will be rescued, your father and brother. And family ship. Yes. Malta is meeting her eyes here, and it's strange eyes to her, including the color. Not that, uh, and somehow that didn't matter. She could feel the other woman's words reach for her. We have no other focus than rescuing them. I cannot promise you that we will succeed, but we shall sincerely try. I don't know if your words make me feel better or worse. What I want to tell you is that you have done all that you can. Be content with it. You have a wild young heart. Right now, it is like a caged bird that batters itself against the bars. To struggle harder will only hurt you more. Wait. Be patient. Your time will come to fly, and when it does, you must be strong, not bloodied and weary. Amber's eyes went suddenly wider. Beware of one who would claim your wings for her own. Beware of one who would make you doubt your own strength. Your discontent is founded in your destiny, Malta. A small life will never satisfy you. Malta crossed her arms on her chest and actually took a step back. She shook her head. You sound like a fortune teller, she said. The laugh that came from her lips cracked in the summer air. How you have made my heart beat, she tried to laugh again, to dismiss the moment as a foreigner's social gaffe. And Amber admits, you know, sometimes I do. 
It was her turn to look away, and she looked uncomfortable. Sometimes I am, but a fortune teller is not a fortune maker. We all make our own fortunes. So this is a little scary for Malta, you know, uh, very cryptic, of course, as we come to expect from Mm -hmm. Beloved, the Fool, and Amber. And who do you think is, uh, who do you think Amber is talking about for Malta? Because I think it's Syntaglia. I was wondering if, I mean, I think obviously it's Syntaglia, but I was wondering if it could maybe fit on, like, Janny as well. Could be. I don't know. I guess I like. Yeah. I I don't remember enough of what happens when she gets the tree hog to be able to confidently say that it yeah. absolutely doesn't have anything to do with Janie. True. But true. in the same vein, I don't know that I can be confident that it does. It just mm-hmm. feels like they have a little bit of a war and not war, but like disagreement on power. Mm-hmm. Per yeah. usual with Malta, she's always grasping for more power. And so, I don't know. Yeah, that, that definitely could be true. But it's almost definitely about Tintaglia. And mm-hmm. it's interesting to me that the prophecy says, a small life will never satisfy you, but you need to beware of the person claiming your wings. Mm-hmm. Because in order not to have a small life, doesn't she have to allow the dragon to claim her wings? She's not claiming her wings necessarily. You know, Malta still makes the choice. Sure. Malta is still, you know, has agency. And I think that's what I'm thinking about in that with Tintagli mm-hmm. involved. Okay. I also wanted to ask, do you think this is an uncontrollable prophecy None of the fool's prophecies are uncontrollable, I don't think. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. Uncontrollable prophecy or what? (laughs) Or one that she has had previously and has rehearsed. Mm. Like, did this occur to Beloved in this moment? Oh. Or is this... Something that Beloved had seen before about Malta and decided now was the moment to share. Um, I think the first part is something that Beloved had thought of before or knows about Malta Mm -hmm. because it's talking about, you know, struggles in the future, which does scare Malta. Mm -hmm. And I think the second part, when her eyes grow suddenly wider, I think that is more of kind of a spontaneous uttering. Okay. Yeah, I would agree. Um, it, it really brought to mind the time when she was with Fitz and as the fool and gave the prophecy of the Fitz fixes, fat suffices or whatever. <laughs> Fitz fixes, Fitz, uh, feists, Fitz, fat suffices. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, that because it kind of felt like that one too was involuntarily given, mm-hmm. and so this I was like, oh, I feel like this is, you know, mm-hmm. coming out of nowhere, forced upon the fool to share. Right, right. However, during this conversation, since Amber seems to feel a little uncomfortable with admitting that they are sometimes a fortune teller Malta feels as though she has the upper hand so when Amber says a fortune teller is not a fortune maker we all make our own fortunes Malta asks and how is that but when Amber turned back to meet her eyes the feeling of having the upper hand vanished you earn your future Malta Vestrit the bead maker cocked her head at her what does tomorrow owe you Tomorrow owes me, Malta repeated in confusion. Tomorrow owes you the sum of your yesterdays. No more than that. Amber looked out to the sea again, and no less. Sometimes folk wish tomorrow did not pay them off so completely. And then Malta feels very uncomfortable and needs to change the subject. Mm -hmm. So Amber is just like talking about to Malta here. Hey. 
uh, don't struggle. Be patient because you're not in the worst of it right now. You got your own fight in a little bit Mm -hmm. and you don't want to be weak for that. You got to be strong. Uh, Beware of people who will clip your wings. (laughs) And um, also all of your yesterdays, everything that you do now will uh, lead into your future. Yeah. So make your choices carefully. (laughs) Yeah. Which this part felt more like you're kind of a nasty kid and you need to be nicer. (laughs) probably it wasn't maybe that's just my reading because i don't love malta but but malta yeah changes the subject quickly she immediately feels uncomfortable which is a little telling but you know she goes on to praise paragon and say oh my paragon you look so beautiful and as she does that she grasps the railing as sudden as a snake striking the ship twisted his head to look up at her that was the chilling part The wrecked space between his brow and nose froze her with its shattered glance. The coloring of the rest of his face was so natural, but the chopped place was silvered and splintered wood. Her tongue clove to the roof of her mouth. She gripped the railing to keep from falling. Paragon's mouth parted in a wide, white smile. It was the rictus of madness. Too late for her, he whispered. Malta did not know if he spoke to her or about her. Too late for her. Wide wings hang above her. She crouches like a mouse in the owl's falling shadow. Her little heart beats to bursting. See how she trembles, but it is too late. Too late. She sees her. Knows me as well. He threw back his head. The laughter roared from him. I was a king. He was incredulous in his triumph. I was lord of the three dominions. But you have made me this, a shell, a toy, a slave. Perhaps lightning struck her from the still blue sky. She fell into a roaring black gulf. She tumbled, soundless, through endless black space. Then from nowhere a flash of gold appeared. It was too large a shape for her to see it all. In an instant, it loomed too close to her to be seen. Great talons seized her, wrapped around her chest and waist. They squeezed the air from her. She clawed at them, but they were armored in scales like metal. She could not pry them loose to let herself breathe, nor did she want to fall to her death if they let, her, if they let go of her. Choose a death, a dragon whispered. That's all you have left, pretty little one. The choice of your death. No, she is mine. Mine, let her go. Prey belongs to he who seizes it first. You are dead. I have still a chance at life. I will not see it snatched from me. Iridescent silver clashed suddenly with gold. Mountains collided and fought for possession of her. The talons clenched, cutting her in two. I shall kill her before I let you take her. Malta had no breath left to cry out. There was almost nothing to left of her at all. These two were so immense, there was no room for her to exist in their world. She was going to blink out like a dying spark. Someone spoke for for her. Malta is real. Malta exists. Malta is here. Eventually she wakes up and says, I am Malta. I do want to quick read over a little bit that you skipped there. After the Malta is real, Malta exists. Mm Mm-hmm. As if she were being wound up like a ball of yarn, the layers of herself were gradually restored to her. Someone held her against the maelstrom. I think that part is really important because it lets us know that right now, wherever she is, this is skill river river adjacent. Mm -hmm. Because I think every time Fitz or any other character loses himself in the skill, that's how it's described, as though the pieces of you are flowing away and and when you you, gather them you slowly piece yourself back together yeah Mm -hmm. so i find it interesting that for malta it's yarn specifically but just that mimicry of the skill place (laughs) yeah yeah because she grips that railing and paragon in his madness the one of the dragons in him whichever one she's touching yeah is trying to claim her as prey um and 
maybe it's because she has like the stink of Tintaglia on her or something, or it's recalling some sort of dragon territorial thing, Mm -hmm. but that dragon is going after Malta in some way. I was really wondering why Malta, why now? Obviously now is the first time Malta's ever been there, but if Malta had done this pre meeting Tintaglia, would Paragon's, dragons reacted to her that way i don't think so i really don't because Mm -hmm. there's nothing i mean there are unique things because we follow malta and she's a protagonist in a story but there's nothing actually unique about the makeup of her Mm -hmm. that would i would think would distinguish herself from like althea for example or wintro to make any live ship react that way to her Although I will argue there is a chance that she is more receptive to that's possible whatever this magic is. Yeah, like skill communication like we talked mm-hmm. about before. Yeah, and maybe just is like a bright vessel, has a lot of skill potential. Like I think yeah, Fitz can get a lot of attention too, right? Because he mm-hmm. is so skilled, or he was at one point and then it's dampened. And he's aware of that. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if that's part of it. Maybe not at all. Maybe like you said, it's just that she has made some weird contact with Tintaglia, which marks her as. Yeah. I don't know. And maybe it's also influenced by Amber's speech. Something about the wording of. Yeah, it could be. Clipping the wings. Yeah. I don't know. But uh Yeah. Paragon's dragon is choose a death, and then Tintaglia is, I'm fairly confident in saying it's Tintaglia, piping Mm -hmm. up and say, no, she is mine, let her go, and you are dead, I still have a chance at life. Yes, yeah. I will not see it snatched from me, so Tintaglia's like, no, just let me, you know, Mm -hmm. let me have her because I need her if I'm going to live. But someone is helping Malta back to herself here. And someone uh, held her against the maelstrom of forces that tried to shred her apart. It was like being cupped in warm hands. She spoke for herself, I am Malta. We jump over to Kefria's point of view. In the same moment. Yep, who hears her say, I am Malta. And Kefria's like, of course you are. And that's all that Malta's repeating is, I am Malta. I am Malta. Mm -hmm. And Amber kind of takes control of the situation and says, I get her off the ship to Althea. Right. Kefria notes that Malta is currently laying in Amber's arms. Mm -hmm. And that Amber has one hand under the head of Malta or cupping her neck. Mm -hmm. And as Malta is taken away, first by Althea, who lifts her up, And then by Brashen, who takes her out of Althea's arms, she notes that Amber is quickly putting her gloves back on and she just gets a tiny glimpse of the her disfigured hands. Yeah, which is a weird thing to say because her hands aren't disfigured. Well, that's not necessarily true. We know that the silver, when on Verity's arms and hands, made it go down to the bone. Like it was, mm. it like made, it was sickening to look at according to Fitz because oh. it lo- it like sucked the li- the life out of his hands, I thought. So maybe, I, maybe they would just like be bony. Desiccated, yeah, yeah, bony fingers, maybe. And yeah. also, I don't think Amber's full fingers are covered, right? No, or, it's just fingertips. So maybe it looks weird because the parts of the fingers that are silvered are like yeah. more sunken in. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's not ever really described in detail, I guess. In the middle of that, uh, Paragon, as Kefria notes, is weeping. And he's rocking the ship at the same time. And he's saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And Amber tells him irritably, be quiet. You did nothing. Just be quiet. So uh, Amber is kind of, as I mentioned, taking control of the situation Help me get her off the ship right now. Something in the foreigner's voice brooked no argument. Althea, like you mentioned, starts to lift Malta up, but Brashen takes her, and Kefria glances at 
Amber's fingers as she's regloving her hands. And Amber glances up to meet Kefria's stare. The look in the bead woman's eyes chilled her to the bone. What happened to my daughter? I don't know. You should go to her. The first was obviously a lie, the second a plain truth. So Kefria hastens after her daughter off the ship. Selden had begun to cry, and Kefria is kind of annoyed. He's like, why does he have to wail at everything? I also feel bad about thinking that, but come along. Let's go, Selden. <laughs> right. She just, there's a lot going on at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's odd to me that she's like, why can't he be more like a normal boy? When, what do you mean he cries all the time? How would you know? Like, yeah. you know what I mean? You're not around him. You don't know if he cries all the time. But the ship has also quieted and has stopped rocking. So that's another important thing to note, that the ship has been calmed down. And Kefri is annoyed, but following after Malta. Mm -hmm. She has is, is now convinced that this is a horrible omen for the voyage mm -hmm. because her daughter is laying on the ground in front of a crowd. Basically unconscious. Yes. Just kind of moaning, I am Malta, over and over again. Yeah, so it's just not great. She is a little worried about what this means for the family fortune. But Kefria says to her daughter, yes, you are Malta. You're here and you're safe, Malta. As if those words were a magic charm, the girl suddenly opened her eyes. She looked around dazedly, then gasped. Oh, help me up, she begged her mother. Rest a moment longer, Russian counseled her. But Malta had already seized her mother's arm and was pulling herself upright. What happened, she demanded. Amber had come off the ship and wormed her way to the front of this as everyone was gathered around and told her, you fainted. That is all. I suspect the light on the water dazzled you. That can happen, you know, if you stare at the sea too long. I fainted, Malta agreed. She lifted a hand to pat nervously at her throat and gave a giddy little laugh. How silly of me. Her words and gestures were so contrived that Kefria could not believe that anyone could accept them. But Devad bustled up to add, The excitement of the day, no doubt. And we all know how Malta has pined for her father. No doubt this launch of his rescue has overwrought the poor child. Malta glared at him. No doubt, she said in a venomous little voice. Even thick-skinned Devad seemed to feel the barb. He recoiled a bit and looked at her oddly. I fainted, Malta repeated. Dear me, I hope I have not delayed the sailing. So it seems like, to me, Amber's like, you fainted, right, Malta? Mm -hmm. That's it. That's all that happened. Don't talk about it. <laughs> well, it's odd to me that Malta just goes with it. Yeah. But she's like, ha ah, yeah. So I think Malta's terrified. And I think she recognized one of the voices. Mm. Who's like, no, she's mine. Right. <laughs> Yeah, fair because enough. she does say a dragon talk to me when Paragon starts to to speak. One of Paragon's dragons starts to speak. Right. So I think Malta is just like actually terrified at this point. Okay. But I guess, do you think Malta thinks Amber knows what happened? Mm. Or, and recognizes Amber as the one who pulled her back into being? I don't know if she fully recognizes or knows 100%, but probably... You know, if it was written from her perspective, she had an inkling <laughs> mm. or suspicions about who did what. I will also point out, I don't think you read this part, but whenever she gets up, she rubs the back of her neck and winces. Mm. Do you think there's silver residue left over there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think she is silvered there. Mm. I think it's talked about later, actually. Mm. Okay, so that's it's just so weird to me that Amber can still leave silver fingerprints. I guess it has to be it consciously clings, done, right? It clings to anyone living, I believe. Mm. Because, you know, it happened to Fitz, got the silver on his wrist. It uh -huh. happened to Malta with on the back of her neck, and that's why Amber keeps her hands gloved. So... Yeah, I, I think that she definitely did leave residue. And I, as I mentioned, I think it's remarked on later mm. that she might have some silver on the back of her neck. But it's really funny to me that Kefri is like, oh, 
Malta's so bad at lying. Yeah. And no one could believe the words that she's saying because everything's so contrived. Right. Miss, I believe anything Malta tells me if I like the way it sounds. Right. So Malta's, of course, playing her part and being like, oh, I hope I didn't delay the sailing. I hope you guys can still go on. It's my fault, you know. Right. To which Brashen replies, not by much, but you are right. We have to be on our way, which is a nice little out for everybody. Mm -hmm. This can clear up. They have to go. But before they do go, um, Trader Ashe stepped up to Brashen. Let your men save their backs. I'll have the boats from the sea rover give you a tow out. Leave room for one from Winsome, Trader Larfa Braid. In a moment, half a dozen other live ship owners had offered assistance. At this point, Kefria isn't sure if this is a sign of how eager they were to have Paragon out of the harbor or the a little show of good faith and help that they are able to give since they haven't been very helpful before now. But she can't. She can't really say either way. And honestly, they haven't questioned Paragon's right to be in the harbor. So maybe it is just good nature from them. And by the way, Brashen responds to them by saying, gentlemen, I give you my thanks. It's clear that he is having the exact same thoughts. So no one reboarded the vessel, but they did say their goodbyes right there on the dock because they had already left. And um, Kefria is remarking that Ronica is more emotional than Kefria thought she would get. And Kefria's own feelings are kind of torn because as she's saying goodbye to Althea, she doesn't, she wishes things turned out differently, but doesn't really know what to say at this point. Right. And also like, whose fault is it that they didn't turn out differently, Kefria? Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah, so she's not sure how to feel she's very conflicted but they're leaving kefria does remark that it was even more disturbing to turn from that and see amber holding one of malta's hands in her two gloved ones take good care of yourself the foreigner was saying to her her gaze was far too intense i will malta had promised her they spoke almost as if malta were the one sailing off into the unknown kefria watched amber turn away from her daughter and reboard the ship a moment later, the bead woman reappeared on the foredeck by the figurehead. She leaned down and said something to him. The carved figure dropped his hands away from his face. He brought his head up, took in a breath that swelled his chest, and then crossed his arms on the chest tightly. His jaw set into lines of stark determination. And the lines are cast off, and everyone is kind of said their final goodbyes, and the ship starts being towed out into the harbor. Althea and Brashen joined Amber on the foredeck, and each in turn bent to speak to Paragon, but if he acknowledged them in any way, Kefria could not see it. She glanced away from the spectacle and found Malta staring raptly at the ship. She could not decide if her daughter's expression was one of terror or love. Nor, she frowned to herself, could she tell if she had stared at the figurehead or Amber. Malta gasped, and Kefria immediately looked out into the ship again. Small boats were catching back the lines thrown to them, and Brashen was waving his thanks as the sails began to blossom on the ship's rigging. Despite the men scampering about frantic frantically, it was truly graceful sight. As Kefria watched, the figure had suddenly threw wide his arms as if to embrace the horizon. He shouted, and a trick of the wind carried the words to them. I fly again! It was a triumphant challenge to the world. Tears are pricking Kefria's eyes, and... She hears Malta say a prayer, and her voice breaks. May Sa speed you. Kefria says herself aloud, May Sa speed you and bring you safely home. And Paragon sails off. Right, and the breeze seems to blow away Kefria's prayer. Mm -hmm. Who do you think Malta is looking at? Is it Paragon? Is it Amber? Is it both? And is it terror or love? Or is Kefria just completely wrong in her assumptions about how intense Amber is being with Malta? Maybe 
In my mind, it's possible that Malta is looking at Amber with respect, which I can see Kefria confusing for love because she probably sees that look only directed at Kyle from Malta usually, <laughs> <laughs> which is very mean of me to say, but I do think that's true for Malta, that her respect and love are very intertwined. However, I don't think she loves Amber. But I do think something transpired between them. I think Malta on some level understands that Amber helped her and is providing her with some sort of help. Well, if they did, if she did silver the back of her neck, they have some sort of connection now too. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the fool names a horse Malta later. Right. (laughs) Yeah. After her. So like, I I think they do have some sort of connection. So I believe you there. And I I agree with that, some sort of respect or at least understanding between them. Mm -hmm. But I think she's looking at Paragon as well. And that's with terror. Right. No, definitely. I think that's also a good read because of what just happened. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. Odd. It's interesting to me that Beloved likes Malta as much as they do because I feel as though Malta is very adjacent to Starling, but Beloved hates Starling. But Starling's not messing with her boy, you know, not messing with Fitz. You mean Malta? No, no, Starling. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Starling messed with her boy. Sorry. Yeah. (laughs) Malta is not. And Malta has... An actual part to play. Okay. <laughs> Harsh. Um, well, she frees yeah. Tintaglia. True. It's what probably the most important thing that the fool does, you know? Yeah. Definitely. So I think that's why. Yeah, fair enough. But I, I just mean also there has been other comments made by Amber in this series of I like Malta. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's always like, what do you mean? I don't know. Well, fairly short chapter, but like I uh, like I thought, there's lots going on here, lots to talk about. Right. Lots, lots of, of in-depth things happening. I feel mm-hmm. like the short chapters are the longest to get through because Sometimes, of that. Yeah. yeah, because they're so they have so they're so dense, I guess. Well, thanks for tuning in and sticking with us this long through this density. <laughs> if you have thoughts on the chapter or on you know what Malta is feeling, the connection between her and Amber, please let us know. You can email us at isfitshappy at gmail.com. We read all of those, of course, even though we might not directly reply to them. We will talk about them usually on the podcast here. And of course, we read all of them. And you can also message us, DM us, comment on any of our posts on any of our social medias, our Twitter, Facebook, Threads, uh, YouTube. We have an account on Reddit as well, so we kind of read through threads on there as well so thanks so much for tuning in we can't wait to hear from you and can't wait to uh for you to tune in next week as we continue this journey yeah it's starting to get good now we get to talk about my favorite part which is the stuff that you guys have brought to our attention I think we're going to start with a comment on Facebook that is a little bit more lighthearted. Um, for last episode, episode 187, I asked the question, what sort of worldly things would you teach Wintro? And Cookie Baker replied that they wanted Edda to teach Wintro to be a designer. Yeah, Cookie Baker mentioned that he was an artist in the monastery and uh, they would love to see him learning to sew, you know, because yeah. like Adam makes all their own clothes. So it'd be interesting to see Wintro make more art. I'd be interested to see if like the dragon and serpent stuff comes out again, if he did more stained glass. Yeah, I, I can imagine him embroidering like mm-hmm. really pretty serpents yeah. and dragons. But apparently... He does the stained glass with his fingers and makes designs. I think embroidery would take too long to fall into that trance. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it would be even better. Embroidery doesn't take that long if you're really good at it, I think. I mean, okay. it still takes a while, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, interesting is fun little fun little comment there. Yeah, so thank Thanks. you, Cookie Baker. 
Um, and then backing up a little bit to episode 186, we had some comments on the episode. Uh, yeah, some discussions that we had from those um, from that episode. Yes. So one was the north wall versus west wall conversation. Like we thought it was a, uh, I think we discussed it earlier as well, that it was different in different editions. Mm -hmm. And what seems to be the consensus is that the HarperCollins slash UK versions have north wall. Yes. And the US versions have west wall. That's what I'm seeing, at least, from yes. anecdotal evidence. Yeah, we had readers, uh, Jessica and Ellen, both re uh, write in mm -hmm. with UK versions that say Northwall. Yes. So, interestingly, although Ellen wonders if maybe it's an older edition of the book as that well. The North, yeah. And that they, real they looked at a map in newer editions and so put forward the West Wall instead. West Wall. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I thought we looked up your version and that it was not altered from the first edition. So, I mean, I could be wrong. Yeah, it says this edition is the complete text of the original book or hardcover edition. Not one word has been omitted. So I'm guessing it was changed for UK. And maybe there is some, um, I don't know, concern over Westwall. Oh, being yeah. a prominent thing. I don't mm -hmm. know. So, yeah. yeah, thanks for writing in about that. Ellen also mentions that they totally forgot that the ships turned into dragons at the end of the series <laughs> and kind of like blanked it out, maybe thinking it was too fantastical and just kind of got reminded as we had that conversation. So that was funny to read, too. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. I feel like a lot of parts of these books, we get to it. And I'm like, oh, I forgot this happened. <laughs> And finally, on that uh, episode, Degenhart uh, responded because we had a discussion about the choose to be happy and how they handled, they meaning Amber, Brashen, and Althea, handled Paragon and the boundaries or withdrawing love as Degenhart had first brought up, how that went and how, and if it was fair or not for him. Right. And Degenhart um, was persuaded by us, actually, that it was not a withdrawal of love and it was setting of boundaries and that it was, I don't know, maybe still could be communicated better. Yes, which I totally agree. But it wasn't agree. like an abusive kind of thing that they did. Right, at least not intentionally. Yes, exactly. But yeah, it leads into an interesting conversation because we did get other emails about that topic as well, uh, namely Jessica... Uh, wrote in to talk about the just choose happiness discussion in general and that Jessica agrees that it is a very simplistic thing that normally needs much more nuance but coming from Clef it was a perfect conversation to have with Paragon because then Paragon could have control over something right and Clef is also young so it speaks to that childish side of paragon a little bit easier mm -hmm. and gives it gives i guess excuse isn't really the word but gives an excuse for such a blanket statement because it is a young child's way of talking out how to just move on from traumatic events i yeah, guess exactly yeah just says in here that uh they would roll their eyes at anybody who actually said it to them in right. real life <laughs> But for this specific scenario, it, it worked out well. Yeah. Which, yeah, I think I agree with as well. So thank you, Jess. Yes. For writing it about the uh, the addition and the uh, the conversation. Yes. We then also have some conversations to have from email about Paragon and Amber from Jonas. Yeah. Kind of tangential to this a bit. Yeah. So Jonas puts forward the conversation that we were talking about with Amber not wanting to carve Paragon's face yes. initially. Yeah. And my assertion that Beloved has a thing for beauty, mm -hmm. although they do, Jonas does kind of 
stipulate that it's not necessarily things that everyone would find beautiful. It's right. very objective to the fool. I have the beholder and all that yeah, sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so Jonas kind of yeah. uh, took your side in it and said that, yeah, I think that beloved does have that view on beauty and wouldn't want to mar anything about Paragon. Right. And also points out that it's not just outward beauty that fool sees or cares yeah. about. Yeah. It really highlights that. Yeah. Beloved is not a superficial person when mm-hmm. it comes to beauty, but just the beauty of everything of that object. Right. And especially with something like Paragon, it's more about the inside workings of Paragon as much as it is about the outside. And how you can even see objectively the figurehead that Amber does end up carving for Paragon isn't super handsome. Although Jonas says you could argue that. Yes. Because <laughs> apparently Fitz is very attractive. <laughs> uh, yeah. What is with Hob only choosing hot lead characters? Well, <laughs> I would say he probably was going to be attractive and then he got, you know, some multiple scars and broken noses and... Got you can still be attractive a few times. With- sure, sure. <laughs> Just not as attractive, probably. I don't know. He still gets hit on even with the scars and broken nose and That's true. Tom Badgerlock hair. That's true. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> thank you, Jonas, for bringing that. Also, Jonas mentioned uh, with last episode, which had more Kenneth focus, that Kenneth is indeed a pig. So yes. mm-hmm. I thought that was very funny and we had to mention it. <laughs> Speaking of Kenneth thoughts, we have a an email from uh, Catherine, who is a little bit behind, but has some thoughts on Kenneth himself. And Catherine actually brings a really interesting perspective for us because Catherine is a therapist. Yeah. And so was talking from the perspective of somebody who has more of that background and has said that they really enjoy Hobbes' portrayal of trauma and it's done very well Mm -hmm. finishes up i'll I'll go back we'll go back through some of the details of Catherine's theories here but the general topic of it is Catherine is saying in my professional experience people can close themselves off to all sorts of vulnerable parts of themselves in order to feel a sense of safety and i wonder if kenneth is an extreme version of that yeah. Which we, we've talked about briefly about something like that, but Catherine kind of goes into detail about the things that Kenneth feels is his luck, mm-hmm. for example, might just be his empathy shining through finally, like his, him breaking out of his shell of safety. You know, his luck yeah. that, oh, he went down to the hold of the, the first slaver and it was so smelly that his tears were welling up out of his eyes, you know? And it was so abrasive, but like, was that his compassion? And was he actually crying? You know, things like that. Yeah, I guess him giving the coin to the beggar in Divi Town was that him feeling bad for the beggar, or was that his luck coming through and it told him to give the coin, and then the beggar told him about information to save him? You know, like yeah. So Catherine really does have a good way of uh, phrasing things, and I really like this theory that the luck is coming from not actual luck it's just him being empathetic all of the examples given are technically part of points where he kind of is being empathetic like when he saves etta it's could be because of empathy and whenever he is afraid of the townspeople running at him but decides to not react is that luck or is that recognizing that just because people are running at you doesn't mean that it is an attack so i like this idea that there is empathy coming through and it's so foreign to kenneth that he just assumes it's luck i don't know i I, something about it's just really good i really like the idea yeah Catherine says that uh, their thinking on kenneth is that he has had to cut off his humanity as a response to the trauma he's experienced and it's stopped being safe to be able to care for others so that foreignness of the empathy maybe shining through is because he had to take care of himself. And we've talked about how he physically removed some of that pain to be safe from himself and put it into Paragon. 
And I think that's just like Catherine says, kind of might be an extreme version of what um, their experience is in the real life. Right. And Catherine does cite a couple other characters in the books that do similar things, like Althea pretending that she doesn't like Brashen because it's safer not to, things like that. But Kenneth is kind of taken to that one end of the extreme. Right. So thank you, Catherine, for bringing that to our attention. I really, really like your examples and the idea of it. And regardless of if that was Hobbes' intention, I think that's now how I will read it. And we'll have to keep note going forward if the luck is still tied to empathetic Kenneth. I think that'd be a fun task to try to remember to do. So thank you. We also have a message from listener Julie. Julie is also a little bit behind. So their discussion or her discussion is more about the first trilogy, but it is and talking about like the magic systems. Yeah. Yeah. And so Julie wanted to talk about her take on the wit. Yeah. Specifically, Julie is kind of talking about, um, I believe we've touched on this briefly and thought this probably years ago at this point, (laughs) but kind of the, uh, wit is portrayed from human to animal connection. Mm -hmm. So what about animal to animal and what about human to human? Right. Because skill can be human to human. So what about the wit? Like, is there some sort of human to human connection with that? And I think it is an interesting topic. And I seem to remember bringing up the fact that Fitz describes something in, I think, his Tom Badgerlock writings mm-hmm. about a a mother being able to wake up to the slightest disturbance of her baby. And that's kind of like a manifestation of the wit. Mm, right. I don't know if we get any more examples, but it seems to be kind of a... Uh, at least described on Fitz's behalf, uh, a nurturing kind of um, human, not human, but um, kind of empathetic, compassionate magic. Yeah. Where it's a connection to feelings and the emotions and the life force of other people or other things. And Fitz mentions that he can sense other people, and that's why it's so weird that he can't sense the fool. So it seems to be that the wit connects all of them, but I don't know if there's ever more of an example besides the mother and child example of humans staying connected with another human, especially adults. Yeah. I I do want to say I don't know if the wit has anything to do with compassion necessarily. I do agree it's with life force. I think Mm -hmm. sensing a baby before it's about to cry is like an in i don't know it's going towards instinct rather than compassion because the instinct of a mother of any being is to protect a child right that's just like a a thing chemical thing that happens so (laughs) um so i'm wondering if because i was just trying to think what would distinguish skill from the wit Yeah, the compassion thing for me is more so a result of the wit rather than Mm. this magic itself is compassionate. It's because you're connected emotionally with all these people. You kind of have to feel compassion for the people you're connected with. I Um, guess. That's in my opinion, at least. Yeah, I guess that's where I was confused. I don't know that the the connecting of feelings is that a hundred percent from the wit or is that skill being unconsciously used by Fitz? You know, like, Mm, I feel like that's kind of described as a, a thing of the wit of the old blood, even by Webb. you know, like he mm. sees through the eyes of his creature or whatever. Like you use each other's senses, you're in each other's mind, you, you're thinking their thoughts. So while, Fitz uses both we don't know the actual distinction between what is skill and wit with him to me it seems that some of those abilities are described from people who just have old blood okay okay 
Okay, yeah. That I think that's where I was yeah. not fully meeting up. But yeah, no, I, I would agree though that there's there's gotta be the potential, right? But I guess why would Maybe. you if you had the opportunity to mind connect with anything in the world, why would you choose a human being? <laughs> yeah, I, I think unfortunately the closest we see is Fitz connecting with somebody else because he is both. But I don't know if that's because you have to make that connection with the skill first. Mm. And then he has like the wit backing it and intertwined with that. And that's why he smells like wet dog. And <laughs> there's like a stink on him or whatever, you know, it's an abomination. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's possible with just the wit. Yeah. I don't know. But I do like the idea of two humans being bonded through the wit. That's interesting. Would they become extra human? Yeah, <laughs> like you I, know how you like get the traits of your mm-hmm. bond partner <laughs> they're just extra normal <laughs> if one's short tempered and one's really patient maybe they'll just balance each other out yeah i don't know i don't know either but no i think it's a good thought process also the thought then could you send your dying consciousness into a human is a really good question because you came right. with the wit partner yeah. with an animal and would that work with just the skill? Like, can you do that? Or yeah. is that just a projection of your mind? Or is it, you know? Yeah. Because they work very similarly. Right. In some ways. Yeah. Which is why, like, we talked about how both of those magics together are pretty much just dragon magic. Yeah. 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 Interesting questions. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, anything else that you wanted to touch on in that email? Uh, no. So thanks, Julie, for uh, talking to us about wit. <laughs> and then finally, we have an email from reader Nathan. And Nathan is bringing up a tinfoil hat theory, which you already know I love. But I am even more excited because this is a thought I also had and then forgot to talk about on the pod. Oh, really? So, yeah. Nice. And so I was like, oh, I guess I'll just... You know, maybe bring it up if I remember and then I never remember. So thank you so much, Nathan. (laughs) But Nathan's tinfoil hat theory is that a live ship doesn't take every single piece of wizard wood from a log. Hence why there's birth control in the Kenneth in Kenneth's charm, you know, extra pieces are left out. So any offcuts slash sawdust may be processed into paper. I know paper is hard to make in this universe, but wizard wood paper would be way more durable. At least I imagine it would be. So it would last a long time and may give magical reason to the memories for the memories to being stored in them. The binding might also be wizard wood. So I didn't think it was the paper. I thought maybe the cover of the book was made out of wizard wood i did bring that up last time yeah yeah i could see that happening i like the idea of the sawdust being turned into paper i don't know how that works practically but it should theoretically be possible yeah it it would be possible the only issue i have with this Mm -hmm. is maybe they haven't encountered it because it hasn't been long enough but once they fill up the log book then what I, maybe it's Tom Riddle's diary. It's, right, yeah. But like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. they would have to rebind or make another volume and then there's no more sawdust or wood from that particular plank. So mm. would that second logbook then fail and not be good or anything? But I really, I do like the theory and it's yeah. interesting. Maybe they know live ship has lived long enough. Maybe they've had enough space for 400 years or 250 years of entries. Right. I don't know. I kind of doubt they have (laughs) enough uh, room, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. To be fair, making a ship would have to create a ton of sawdust, right? Oh, yeah. So maybe each family that like Rainwild family that owns a ship has stacks of extra paper for that. Yeah. yeah, For their specific family that they will sell if you need. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's a very interesting theory. It's cool, though. Yeah, I do like Um, the theory a lot, so thank you for telling us about it. So thank you, Nathan, and thank you to everyone who wrote in. It's always nice to hear from you guys, and we love hearing your theories and thoughts. 